um, I, I think Ted's a great man. He's been coming out for a long time. One of my fondest memories of Ted was the uh, um, one year he showed up and he, he said, He tells the story every, every year, year. Every year. What? It, someone else know about Ted's cruise control? Wait, so, who hasn't been here before? Yeah, who's, we'll who's, 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 who's their first MUCON? All, All right. right. That's good. Oh my gosh. That's, that's pretty good. So, so Ted, uh, his drive got a lot easier one year. And, and he, he told me how. He said, I, I, I now have cruise control. I said, oh, you got it like retrofitted in your car? He's like, no, I have the stick. And it's notched, and it says 55, 65, and 75. So depending on where he's at, he just puts it on the gas pedal and jams it underneath there and then just steers. Um, Ted, we are happy he makes it every year in one piece. <laughs> so yay, Ted. Yay. All right. All right, are, streaming, are you ready? They're like, no. Taping, yay. Taping's ready? Thumbs up, I cross the board. I can't see All my right. blue shirts. Hey, where's your shirt? I, I'm, I'm not wearing a shirt yet. That shirt yet. No one wants that. And just for the record, I am six foot tall and 230 pounds. If you want a point of reference that's not I'm an not NFL football player. I'm not going to tell you how tall I am or so, how much I weigh, just to be clear. Aw, uh, anyway. Right. Uh, for those that don't follow our president's weight, that joke made no sense. Um, <laughs> that's pretty funny. <laughs> we, can, we can go now. That's like the third time he's told me that joke, and I still giggle. Okay. <laughs> Um, so this is, uh, your badge is actually a uh, site survey tool. I don't know if people had figured that out yet, but the, there's two LEDs on it. The back LED is just on to look cool. It flashes on purpose. It's not a short or a bad solder, which is actually my first thought. And then I'm like, oh, all of them do that. Um, it's supposed to look like flames on a rocket ship. Also, that's a rocket ship. Did anyone not figure that out? I had a few people that were like, what the f They're like, it's a moose, and they're holding it upside down. Yeah, that was our son. That was actually our son. I didn't want to call him out, but it was, yeah, it was our son. He's like, this is a really weird-looking moose head. Like, the older this is one. It's a fucking rocket, guy. <laughs> Second year in college, and he's like, it's a weird-looking moose. Uh, <laughs> at least. <laughs> yeah, yeah, see, as they get older, they'll flick me off. <laughs> actually, I wouldn't put it past Daxton. So, he's standing um, over there, too. The, the top uh, LED <laughs> is actually um, tied to, right now, uh, shpucon-wpa. So as you walk around the con, if you have good signal strength, it's green. If you have moderate, it's yellow. And if you have bad, it's red. And if you can't see it at all, um, it's actually off. So it's meant to tell you when you're at the con and when you're not, or when you're at my house, because right now there's a test network called shpucon-wpa. So, and it's uh, good everywhere. Please don't come to my house. Um, so um, we have an um, interesting badge story. We tried to, like, pull a DEF CON or something. Yeah, um, so on purpose, we've never really done electronic badges. We've always kind of poo-pooed them and, and done our own thing. And this year, we were like, you know what? We're going to do an electronic badge, but it's going to be this cool, composed thing where it's all, like, injected molded, and it's got a purpose and whatever, and it's not some tinker toy and that kind of thing. So um, we contracted it out and, and got the work done. And a couple things happened on the way to the con. Um, <laughs> The first one is we get a lot of deliveries at our house, like a lot. Um, and so like a UPS truck shows up one day and says, I have 43 boxes for you, which is not an uncommon amount of boxes for us to get delivered to our house around Shmukon time. And I'm like, cool, because 12 of those are our badges, and I'm super excited about them. So we're sitting there, we're piling down, piling down, piling down all the boxes. The kids are taking them inside. And guess what happened? We only got 11 boxes. Plus one. Instead of the 12 that the badges were in. And the UPS driver was kind of frantic because she's like, it, it says here it's on my truck. And I'm like, well, can you look? And she looked and basically tore her power to an empty truck. Um, and the box is not there. So we went inside. UPS driver's actually in our house. Like, we're counting boxes, looking at everything, you know. And she can't find it. We can't find it. And so we kick off the old lost package tracking process. Which was not... Obvious. Well, it didn't work. You'll figure that out pretty soon. Yeah, it, didn't, it did not work out. So what we determined was inside the box were all the staff and speaker badges, um, about 800 of the backs of the, the, fins. The, the back part of the badge, and then about 400 or so of the fronts. So that's about, uh, you know, what, 30% of the attendee badges and all the staff and speaker badges. We had all the circuit boards, so that's... Good. And the other good thing is that we have a laser cutter. So we were able to fabricate a good portion of the backs. They're a different color blue. I don't think anybody in this room has one of those yet. You all got good badges. Yeah, you, congratulations. You got the good badge. Showing up Yay. early. Bonus points. 
They don't smell right. If they're no, not laser they cut, they don't smell. You can't get high on the badges, sir. I'm sorry. Right. And we were able to cut um, smelly badges for the speakers and the staff. The good news is we have all of the cores, which are the blinky bits, and um, those are what actually attach to your lanyard. So the core is actually your badge. That's what's going to get you in the door. Yes. Yeah, the circuit board is the thing that it will be required to get you in, because later on you will see attendees roaming around with just circuit boards because we're lame. Um, the other thing that happened is we turned them on and I showed them to Heidi. As soon as I lit up the Schmoocon WPA network at home, she's like, well, that's fucking bright. Um, the top LED was at full throttle, right? And it this was, is a it was bright. painful. You could not have a conversation and look at someone if they had the LED on their chest. It was just like, ah, and you were blind. Right. So, so we had a um, party. And we, um, we sat around and uh, people, some people stuffed batteries in the badges and then other people plugged the badges into laptops and they reprogrammed all 2,400 badges. Um, and then another group of people screwed together the badges that we had parts for. So in the time-honored tradition of hacker cons having to reflash their electronic badges <laughs> the night before the conference, we, yeah, woo woohoo, let's hear it for achievement unlocked on that shit. Um, the magic smoke only got let out of a couple of them. Um, uh, Jackie, who I don't think is in here, had the brilliant idea of turning them all on um, between stations so that we, they were all tested. Well, the problem is when they're all on and then they touch metal to metal, um, <laughs> yeah, that's not go, good. Jackie. That's usually a short. <laughs> so I, then we had to rush and turn them all off so my house didn't catch fire. Because uh, there's a lot of potential energy in 5,000 batteries. I'm not sure if you're aware of that, but it seems <laughs> like a bad idea to release it all at once. So. All right, are we ready for like the boring housekeeping stuff? Sure. All right, here we go. You should speak in the microphone because I get really loud. I just like standing here. Oh my God. <laughs> you want me to do this? Oh, totally. Oh, I... <laughs> um, I'm so sorry. So seriously, I thought you were gonna do these. Her silence would indicate to the contrary. <laughs> um, so who's here? Uh, all the volunteers are in blue except, well, I'm in blue. I'm just in the wrong blue. And Heidi doesn't wear a shirt because it helps keep the um, trouble from coming to her. Yeah, even, yeah, there we have our model there and everything. Um, so we put all of, our, um, all of our volunteers, regardless of role, if they're in labs, if they're on streaming, if they're on security, they're all in blue shirts because we want you to be able to approach any staff member and ask a question. It doesn't matter the nature of the question, you know, it, uh, where are the bathrooms, why is this trash can full, I have a security concern, you know, what, I'm big why? on the trash cans, man. Where are the trash cans? Um, <laughs> Just walk up to a staff member and ask. And if they don't know the answer, they'll find a person who does know the answer and help you out. Um, we've been uh, doing that since day one of ShmooCon, and it's worked out very well for us. So uh, we really encourage you to um, you know, talk to the staff members if you have any questions at all, and, and they're there to, to assist. I am um, rather disappointed in Bruce because I got him a special shirt. Um, if you are familiar with Star Trek lore, I did buy Bruce a red shirt. Yeah. He does not have it on. She loves me. Should be looking, never mind. Right, um, right, right, right. All right, more who? Um, we got sponsors. They're all in the program. Many of them are on signs and things of that nature. Um, we always challenge our sponsors to do more than stand at a booth, right? And for those that have been here before, you know that this is not a trade show. Um, there's not some room off in the nether regions where all the sponsors get banished to, and they hope that you all show up and ask them, what do you do? Um, so instead, we put them right in the bottom of the escalator so it's a fire hazard, um, and then we encourage <laughs> them to have another time on our super tradition. engaging contests so that it's even <laughs> greater fire hazard. They can collect right in front of Reg, and we have to yell, get the fuck out of the way every time I want to go to Reg. It's really <laughs> exciting. Um, so we encourage you to stop by our sponsors. Uh, they put a lot of time and energy into the contest, into the different um, uh, uh, you know, giveaways and things that they have going on. And um, uh, please uh, help them make this worth it for them. I, I can switch these faster if you don't want to have to talk to oh, them. No, I'll talk all day. You get, you'll know I'll talk all day, right? Okay. Well, you all... <laughs> So, um, speakers, I get really excited about this because inevitably there's somebody on Twitter or on Facebook every year who's like, oh, Shmukon, they always have the same people speak. And it's just not true. Every year these percentages are about the same. So this year we have 67 speakers, around 42 of whom have never been on our stage. And I get super excited by that. And six or seven of them have never spoken at a conference before. So. <laughs> yeah. 
That one picture is apparently taken with a camera from like 1994. Yeah, I was in a hurry. I just like used the preview images, sorry. And Mike Osman is there, which is great. Hi, Mike. And Rick. Well, I know, but Mike. Son. But we have a special bond. Well, we Mike. do. And, and Mike, I told him this earlier, but in theory, if you're from UAS, can you raise your hand? Holy shit, did you guys graduate from there? Holy shit, you graduated from UAF, yay! See, they could do it, we couldn't, Mike. It was really, yeah, it was we, just. We suck. It's very rare you meet a person who went to the University of Alaska Fairbanks and graduated. Um, it's a professional place to go to school and drop out. Except for them, they're cool. Yeah, what'd you major in? Comp Sci, wow. They still have the Cray there? Uh, is our next machines? It's all older than shit when we were there, so. <laughs> I still have an account. <laughs> I, I have a piece of a cray under my desk. I should, yeah. Yeah, anyway. Um, so, oh. what? Go ahead. Are you sure? Yeah. I can't tell, you should have labeled, like, Heidi does this slide. She, I wrote notes. Okay, she wrote notes. Um, so we did uh, Schmooze a Student again this year. So for those that don't know, Schmooze a Student's an opportunity for students to get into the con, have their ticket paid for, and get a $200 honorarium. Uh, the way that it works is that a, um, uh, a schmoozer, the person who gets them in, pays $400 for their ticket. And what that does is buy them their ticket at $150, the student's ticket at $150, and ponies up $100 for the honorarium, and then we throw in another $100 for the honorarium, or stipend, I guess, in this case, since they're students. So every student gets $200 for that. So this year, uh, we We're opened... big pushovers. So this year, we, we just accepted everybody who had a complete application by the deadline. Yeah, so we accepted 83 students. Um, So, and I'll tell you one of my favorite, favorite things to, about student applications is we require them to um, send us a picture of them on campus. So you can see some of the photos there. I didn't ask, sorry. They're all blurry. Um, <laughs> but we get these great pictures, and they just make me laugh when, as the applications are rolling in. So lots of fun. Everyone's fully clothed this year. This year. <laughs> well, and then there was the year that guy sent us a picture of his dinner. Yeah, one guy just said, here's <laughs> some like, chicken. He's like, here's my spaghetti or something. I don't know. It was cool. Um, it was and one good. guy, some guy used a his monitor as cover for his naked self, um, which was, Heidi just started screaming from the other room, and I came running. He's like, there's a naked guy on my screen. <laughs> okay, what next? Um, anyway, sorry, I'm going to... Next slide. Next slide. Okay. We're uh, on to what? Wow. So um, there's obviously the talks. I think people come to the con to go to talks sometimes, question mark. It's always interesting. Like, I haven't really gone to a talk at a con in a, a long, long time. But there's other people He doesn't who, even go to the ones he gives. Yeah, really. I'm pretty checked out. I watched a talk of mine the other day because I f had said something and I wanted to remember what I said. And I swear to God, I don't remember, like, shush, quiet you. <laughs> I, I was actually stunned at how offensive I was. I was like, wow. <laughs> I say fuck a lot. <laughs> A lot. That's seven? That's all I've got so far? What? Fuck, 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 fuck. There. <laughs> Screwed up your accountant, didn't I? <laughs> Don't ever say that. Don't ever say that. <laughs> He's just talking to our seven-year-old behind the screen. He's like, I say it when you're not around. <laughs> I'm sure he does. Um, so, so besides the talks, um, there's an awful lot going on down the hallway. Um, down the, um, the hallway that way, if you haven't made it, there's a whole bunch of little breakout rooms. We've got lock picking, uh, the wireless CTF. There are going to be amateur radio exams on Saturday. So if you've got an existing license, you want to up it, or you want to get your ham uh, uh, license, you can actually get your, what's the first one, technician? Technician. Technician one, you could, uh, most people can study that in a few hours and be ready and just bomb in there and pass it. Um, definitely worthwhile. Um, you can, uh, uh, fire talks are in here tonight? Yeah. Question mark. So they're in here tonight. Uh, Shmoocon Labs is all the way at the end of the hallway. Uh, do we have a slide on labs? Yep. Okay, I'll shut up about that. Um, Hack Fortress, and uh, we have a CTF again back uh, this year. Uh, it's different than the ones that we've had in the past, but we got a brand new CTF so that you can try out. Cool. I love how this is behind me. It's not at all awkward. You can I'm stand like, here. I could, but you have a privacy screen that I installed for you the other day, so I actually have to stand like right here, awkward. Ooh, thanks. I'll reinstall that later. <laughs> Christ. Stop complaining. You know, either way, it was bad, and now and, eh, it's right, right, unrecoverable. Right. It's unrecoverable. Uh, there's contests all over the place. If you see something, you're like, why is that there? <laughs> It's the best fashion accessory I've ever had. Um, 
if you see something in symbols somewhere or other things that are out of place, uh, dig into it. You'll probably find that there's a contest that underlies the whole thing. You'll we'll probably um, play two contests at the same time. Yeah, and yeah, yeah you'll be aware. You're really confused. Be you're like, what? Is, I don't play. Oh. Uh, <laughs> so, so we've been incarnated in puppet form. Um, uh, <laughs> Heidi's got like glasses that match and boots and a little moose T-shirt and a scarf. Uh, I have Birkenstocks and I long hair. That and a scruffy little fucking beard. Uh, so it, it, to tell a story, is, is Andrew is Shmoo in the room? The actual guy Shmoo? No, he must be in registration. So Andrew uh, used to work at, where, where, we went over this earlier. It wasn't a car wash, it was, oh, moving, moving company. Well, with, a, with a guy whose name is Rob. Uh, Rob's name was also a verb that he was very good at because he worked at the moving company. He stole a bunch of shit. Um, <laughs> This is in Anchorage, Alaska, by the way. So if you, anything went missing in the mid-90s, it's probably a guy named Rob when he moved your house. Um, Rob decided he wanted to quit one day, and he walked into his boss's office, and he went, Do you like hand puppets? The guy's like, What? He's like, Do you like hand puppets? Uh, yeah, I guess so. Fuck you! And he walked out the door. <laughs> so we've been walking around all day long with these puppets going, Fuck you! For no particular reason, except there's an homage to He just to, wants to, to up his count. Don't listen yeah. to him. He's just like, I, I get more points. Anyway, so these were these were gifts from dear friends. I just I lost it last night when I when they were given to us. I think they're awesome. She, she did so. spend about an hour hugging herself. I did, I did. It's Where like, does one get little mini Birkenstocks? Is this yourself. like a build a bear thing? Like these are there's like I, cork in here and everything. I, I, I got you. I know who the girl. I, it's, I'm the one spreading around uh, the specific woman on Etsy who is making these puppets, and she's absolutely amazing. Pretty cheap too, like 300 bucks each. Jesus, I, I don't mean to abuse you so badly, sir. <laughs> <laughs> All right, moving on. All right, uh, next uh, Saturday night party uh, in this room. Uh, they'll clear out this room. It'll be uns, 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 and uh, drinks, uh, alcoholic and non. Uh, unlike, again, if you haven't been to ShmooCon in a while and you remember the days of lore when you had to have a wristband to get in, those days are gone. You just show up with your badge and you come in and you talk to people and you have a good time. So uh, we look forward to seeing you on Saturday night. T-shirt sales at 3 o'clock will start in registration. So if you want to buy a T-shirt, please do, because we don't like taking it back to storage. Um, this year, we will also have bags of crap. So bags of crap are all the crap from previous ShmooCons. Um, they are... Thank you. Um, <laughs> got cough drops. They are... Um, Guaranteed to have a t-shirt and then one other piece of big swag and then, you know, whatever things we found at the bottom of dirty boxes. Um, that makes it sound really appealing. I know. Yeah. I know. Isn't that exciting? Here's what I will promise. I promise that no one will get a bag completely full of that word I can't say. Desiccant. Yeah. We usually save those. We, we save all the desiccant packets and do not eat things just to see. Um, <laughs> Like the other day, I was cleaning out the basement. And I found a full backpack full of desiccant that we continue to save year over year, just cause, you know. Keeps um, the basement dry. Keeps the basement dry. Still, it tastes terrible. Um, <laughs> so we we didn't we didn't put all of those in a bag of crap. Nobody's going to get a bag of crap that's completely full of schmoo balls. Um, so there, and it all goes to charity. So t-shirts and um, bags of crap. You give money. You get a little poker chip. You get to pick the three. Or one charity of your choice, which this year is um, Hackers for Charity, EFF, and the Planetary Society. Yay! Yay! This is pretty. Everyone's worried about their job. It's a little low energy in here. Like, am I going to be paid later? Half of We're you are government boring. contractors, half of you are government employees. Um, so the big deal is this is all in your program. And if you haven't figured it out by now, y'all should really open your bags and look in your bags. Somebody's going to be happy. That's all I'm going to say. There might be something in the bag for one of you. For the rest of you, you're going to be like, oh, this is really boring. They're like, lame. She doesn't do the Oprah thing where it's like, cars for everyone. It, does, it doesn't work like that. Just one person. I gave away your car. <laughs> <laughs> no, we didn't. Um, what? Photography rules. <laughs> 
Oh, do we have that on a slide? No, we have notes. I forgot. Oh, okay. Uh, photography rules. Uh, if this is your first MUCON, this may be a little foreign to you. Um, if For those that have been here before, um, this will be a refresher. Uh, we restrict photography to only be uh, consent of the person in frame. So we don't want people standing on stage, clicking a photo of the entire audience. We've had speakers do that. Uh, we've asked them to delete no it. We don't want you guys shots. panning, taking shots in the hallway and that kind of thing. So if you're going to take a photo, if you feel the need to Instagram or Twitter or Facebook, this thing, uh, please make sure everybody in frame uh, has, has your consent, their consent. You have their consent. I have to get my nouns uh, organized today. Uh, I'll do that later. And then um, uh, if we find out that you're taking photos and not asking people politely, we will ask you to uh, leave. So uh, we don't screw around with this. This is kind of an old school hacker tradition. Sir, is there a question in the back? Have speakers given consent? Have speakers given consent? Um, we have the consent forms, question mark? No. No? <laughs> we don't have consent forms. Uh, most of the speakers who are on our stages have agreed to be taped. If they don't, we don't. Um, yeah, we as far that. as I know, I mean, they know they're going to be taped, so that's going to be on the internet, so I presume that they're okay with having their picture taken. Um, that's a good question, actually. Thank you. Um, and that actually brought up another point that I quickly forgot. Okay, so, good. Okay, good. Oh, thank you. Um, we have a Twitter account. There is an unofficial Schmoocon Slack channel that gets like four people posting. I'm looking at two of them. <laughs> you know, so um, you can join that too. I don't know. It's kind of fun. There are two official Schmoocon photographers uh, roaming around oh, with really big the cameras. Photography stuff. Um, so there's. Um, but they um, follow our same rules. Yeah, they follow our same rules. They're not allowed to do the things that you're not allowed to do. So uh, you know they follow the same rules. Carson's there, um, and Vis is the other one. He's running around somewhere. So um, they they do the same things that you all do. Okay. 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 We, there we go. We do have a last minute talk change. Um, unfortunately, one of our speakers is dealing with a canceled flight and so will not be here at four today. It was, um, oh gosh, your, cere your cerebellum as an attack surface um, by Avani. I don't know how to say her last name. Wildani? Anyway, so she's not going to make it. Hopefully, um, if she can come to town by tomorrow we'll put her in uh, during like the lunch break or something and let her give her talk. But in the meantime, um, Wendy Knox Everett's going to talk about uh, blink for your password, blink away your civil rights. So that's going to be, I'm sorry, I keep saying four. It's the five o'clock talk. Five o'clock, yeah. Oh. Okay. Also new this year, historically we've always done 20 minute talks on Friday night, but when um, we opened up the CFP, we decided to do some 20 minute talks in the um, build it, belay it, and bring it on tracks. So we're trying that. That's new this year. The 20 minute talks will be Saturday afternoon. Just something different. Yeah, I'm trying it Woo, out. I mean, okay. one of the nice things about the con is that um, we know we're going to sell out. <laughs> um, <laughs> And so we get to uh, uh, experiment a little bit. Uh, we are certainly in the luxury where uh, we know what's going to work, and then we wonder what might we could do different. So this is one of those things where we're like, hey, let's try doing something a little bit different. So we're trying the 20-minute talks out. Uh, we hope they're a success. Please let us know what you think of them. Okay. Um, in addition, this year we did some reorganization to Shmukon Labs. Uh, for those of you who don't know what Labs is, I always call it my biggest scam of the year because people actually pay to come and set up the con network. I think it's pretty cool. Um, but no, it's a real big learning environment. Um, we had, I don't, 50, 50 labs attendees, give, give or take. Um, and we get separate vendors for labs who come and actually work with the attendees. It's not like a big demo scene. Um, but they actually install product and, you know, the attendees get to... Um, actively use their product while they're there. So as part of wanting to share that more with you, the general attendee, they're going to be doing mini talks again on Saturday. Again, it's in your program. Um, they're going to be at the end of the hour so as not to uh, conflict too much with our main content. Um, but uh, you want to talk about just what, the, what they're going to showcase a little bit? Yeah, sure. So um, part of this is just a response to, like, we used to tell you, like, go down and check out and see what Labs is doing. And you'd walk down there and there's 
things going on, right? There's computers and switches and Ethernet cables and people in weird looking shirts and you're like, wow, that looks really exciting. And then you walk out the door because you really don't know where to start, right? Like if you want to learn about the wireless network, if you want to learn about what's going on from the SOC perspective, there wasn't a good way to kind of get hooked and get started. So instead what we did is we're going to have these 15 minute talks where each functional area, wireless, infrastructure, uh, SOC, threat hunting, that kind of thing, is going to just basically talk about here's what we do. Here's the technology we got. Here's what we found. Here's how we're using it. What do you want to know? Um, and the nice thing is you've got people uh, there um, in these talks that are experts in their, their, their area. They've got access to uh, you know, pretty high-end technology that the vendors are able to give us to run the network and run all the infrastructure. So if you have questions about large-scale virtualization or wireless networking or whatever it is, find that 15-minute window, go down there, start having a conversation. And if the conversation continues after that, like you can just go next door to labs, keep talking. It's totally cool. So it's meant to be open up the door to labs and a little bit more welcoming environment to you all so that you can learn from the work that's been going on down the hallway. Yay, labs. Um, so also new this year for the closing plenary, um, we're going to do something we're calling ShmooCon Debates. We um, very kindly asked four people to come and be guinea pigs for this event. What we did is we selected two topics. Um, we have four people. They don't know what topic they're going to get, and they don't know what side they're going to argue. I do. <laughs> I'm moderating. I am so excited. So um, the two, the two uh, topics. Cryptocurrency. <laughs> so it's cryptocurrency, fat or future. And then I almost get the other one wrong. We did um, consumer IoT security, controlling the climate or burning down the house. That was a good one. Uh, yeah. You want the hand puppet, please? You want the hand puppet? What am I doing here? <laughs> there we go. <sighs> Fuck you! <laughs> all right, I'm going to I'm the next like slide. I'm gonna like this. I mean, we can just go. I'm like, I'm down. <laughs> Puppets fight! Ah! <laughs> oh, I guess I'm, ah! There, that was better. I gotta get used to this whole thing. It's, maybe I'm left-handed or right-handed puppeted. You have glasses, dude. No, it's still attached, see? I got emergency breakaway glasses. Woo! Wee! Oh my gosh, we forgot to bring... <laughs> what? We... Oh, we forgot the... Okay. Okay, it's coming. It's good. There's more. <laughs> There's more. Um, I don't even know. Schedule. It's The schedule's in the program. You're all wearing those impossible to read little things around your neck. Uh, it's on the banners outside. That's better! <laughs> okay, I wrote notes. We're standing in one track mine and, and bring it on. To my right is build it, to my left is belay it, and I actually told myself not to screw it up. So, build it. Woo! Belay it. Wow. Yes! Birds of a feather. <laughs> Jeez, this thing is fun. <laughs> I could take this to a funeral and make it exciting. <laughs> it's gonna get dark now. <laughs> oh, do I need to do something? Oh shit. Okay, so uh, the schmoo ball. Uh, this is really Just distracting. <laughs> Get my hand out of my own ass. Um, <laughs> you knew that was coming. So, um, so when we started ShmooCon, uh, one of the goals was to be able to facilitate discourse with the person on stage. Um, in some ways, hold them accountable, right? Uh, you've been... Uh, in, unless this is your first conference, you've been to a conference where someone on stage has said something that's absolutely untrue, right? Happens at every conference. Someone says something, you're like, well, that's bullshit. Um, and do people we stand up? We just lied for every single slide we put up. Yeah. Do, do you, what? I'm kidding. Okay. <laughs> that's bullshit. So, um, you know, but it's pretty rare for a person to stand up and be like, I disagree. And the person that does, you want to kill them because they're going to be like, I disagree. And then they're going to have a five minute long comment that actually doesn't have anything to do with it. So, um, moose. there we go. This is, this is actually a quote, life-size moose, which is some bullshit. Um, 
It's actually rideable. It's a 150 pound weight limit. Um, and it's Amazon Prime. It showed up the next day. So <laughs> that's really, right? Like, also, it's my second favorite thing that's ever shipped Prime next day. Uh, my first favorite was years ago before Snowmageddon, uh, the Prez who I think is in the room somewhere, um, it ordered, uh, everyone was scrambling to buy snowblowers. And so like the Home Depots and Lowe's and everyone's out of snowblowers. The Prez ordered one prime on Amazon and it was delivered to his house as the snow started. I'm like, that's fucking genius, man. <laughs> like, maybe for the next hurricane, I'll prime a generator. Like that's, <laughs> woo. Anyway, the schmoo ball, I'm sorry, I, get, I should get back on target. Stay on target. So. Um, How themey of you. How theme it was themey. Thank you. That's exactly how I intended it. The uh, the idea then was to have a way that the audience can engage the speaker um, and and kind of call out the bullshit without actually necessarily interrupting and going on some long diatribe because um, it's it's difficult to raise your hand to be like I, I disagree right because then you're challenging the person on stage. It puts you in the light. And a lot of people aren't comfortable with that. It disrupts the whole flow of things. So instead, we give everyone these squishy foam rubber balls and we say if you disagree, just throw it. That's all. And maybe the speaker addresses it, maybe they don't, maybe it starts a dialogue, maybe it doesn't. What usually happens um, when there's really something overtly stupid happening, like one person will throw a ball and then a bunch come, right? Because it's that whole thing, like if you're thinking it, I wonder if other people are, and the answer is yes, right? The whole room was thinking, well, that was stupid. Uh, and then people come scrambling up to recover their schmoo ball, which is the fault, the one problem with the model is you, th you use it once and you're like, oh shit, and then you gotta go run after it or just give it up. Um, also, we discovered that not everyone is coordinated as they would like to be. And I've seen people like <laughs> being in the back of the head. They're like, the hell was that? I, this was a pretty good shot. This was, yeah, this was right in the forehead. That was, it was excellent timing with the shutter. And that's when we banned schmoo cannons. Well, that wasn't that one. The schmoo cannon hit me in the chest. 200 miles an hour. Not a joke. Like, that was really, it hurt a lot. Like, inertia is a bitch. Um, all right, so I will talk a lot more about the whys and the, the back end stuff. We do a, a session called Own the Con every year. Um, you don't need to attend it in person. I almost feel bad about kind of taking up a spot. Watch it later. Come find us, ask questions, email, whatever. We'll give it to an empty room if we have to. It'll be really exciting. But um, just because we're so excited. Yeah. Well, so Own the Con is, is our attempt to be as transparent as we can about what we do so that it's people... It's all the financials. Yeah. Financials, who's call involved. All the paper stuff, yeah. Um, we are not a nonprofit. Um, a couple times last week, people were like, what's your nonprofit number? We're like, oh, I can make one up, but it's going to involve like the number I and some <laughs> symbols. Is that okay? And um, it's imaginary. I, people, math geeks, nod. Yes, thank you. Yeah, woo! Radical negative one is a thing. It's just not real. So, um, <laughs> whew, math geek went deep on that one. So uh, anyway, uh, we are uh, an LLC, but we run it like a nonprofit. And so we tried to disclose like we are. We just don't want to have to have like the federal regulatory issues to deal with. Um, so we don't actually board aren't meetings. a nonprofit. There's no board meetings, just B-O-R-E-D meetings. Thanks, honey. Um, fuck you, thank you. <laughs> All right, um, uh, lots of help. So we have uh, a lot of people, we have volunteers. Um, um, oh my gosh, we have so many volunteers. Like Things like this don't happen, right, without a huge, amazing, wonderful crew. So just real quick, I hope I got them all in here. We've got the selection committee for the call for papers. We've got security. We've got registration. We've got taping. We've got streaming. We've got the AV crew. We've got labs, the party folks, the contest folks. The, not the actual press, but the people who manage the press for me. I mean, we like YouTube press, but... Uh, the Hack Fortress crew, uh, the, the people who are like my neighbors and friends who come over and do things like stuff all those bags for you. Like, it, it's unreal. Um, my boys who live with this endlessly for, come on out, Daxton. Can you say hi? Um, you know, they basically give up their December every year to this effort. I, they let people sleep in their rooms. They live in the garage if we need them to cut badges. It's well, and then, and then last night, the, the green-haired one, uh, as we're in the middle of cutting the backs of the he, replacement I promise, badges. I promise he's not patient zero. That would be the other yeah. one. Yeah. But he comes to me and says, uh, my ear hurts and I can't hear out of it. 
And I'm like, oh, that sounds like an ear infection. So um, uh, Aiden, who's, I think, hiding back there, uh, who watches Daxton uh, for us uh, uh, during the con, uh, we had to give her a quick briefing on how to use the laser because then D Bobby and I had to go run off and go to the doctor and get diagnosed with an ear infection and go to a 24-hour freaking pharmacy where there was almost a fight between some customer and the pharmacist. Super exciting, 24-hour pharmacies, go crazy place. Um, <laughs> And so Aiden actually uh, cut the last year badges. So, uh, you know, thanks to everyone involved in that whole process and getting the badges all functional again. Ooh. All right. Oh, some, uh, one other quick um, housekeeping thing. I guess the parking garage is full, which means nothing to you because you're here. <laughs> um, so sorry, people who are watching me from their car while driving around DC. Um, they are pushing people to the um, nearby parking garages. Um, for those of you not staying at the hotel, we do have a parking discount. I can't for the life of me remember what it is, but there are parking pass like little mag stripe things that I've probably wiped by holding them in my pocket next to my cell phone. Um, but by Reg, they have them, they're little green cards. Um, so go get one of those if you're just driving in and actually got to park here. If you parked someplace else, they won't help you. Did you have, what are you doing? Oh, I'm just double checking to see. Um, I think we got, oh. Uh... Oh. No. Oh. No, we're good. No. We're good. Okay, I'm really sorry to do this to you, but um, oh there you go. Oh my gosh. She's going to turn it. <laughs> Are you scared? I'm so scared. <laughs> I'm so so um, every year um, I take the opportunity to stand on stage and yell at you about something. So, um, and sometimes I, I, um, um, I think I yelled at Erin once because she told me to drink because I said cyber and I said, no, fuck you. And then explained why cyber was okay. And I still feel a little bad about that because I was so vicious about like, <laughs> no, fuck you. And here's why. Um, so I'll try to be a little less aggressive today, but I do ha have a few things I'd like to cover and they may not be popular, but um, they're what I think about a lot. And they're things that I'd like you to think about a lot. So I want to have a little discussion about responsibility in our industry and what that means in 2018 going forward. So I've been, I've been doing this for a long time. Um, I think I really started doing cybersecurity things um, in like 96, 97 kind of time frame. So 20 odd years. Uh, I've been I've been bumping around in this industry. I uh, learned a lot what I need to learn through uh, going to conferences and talking to people and writing shitty code and getting yelled at for all the stupid stuff that I did and trying to trying to improve. And I felt um, for a long time like we have a responsibility to do the right thing. Uh, for those people that have heard me talk before, like I feel pretty passionately like we should design systems that allow users to be as stupid as they'd like to be uh, in order to uh, uh, make them you know, secure, right? Like click whatever link you want, download anything you want, try to run it, do anything you want, and your operating system protect you like you're a three-year-old, right? Like, you know, it's all doll surfaces. You can't harm yourself or your enterprise. And instead we give users like, here's a big spiky thing full of needles and that one's poison and that one's hot and that's the one you can touch. Just touch that one, it'll be okay. <laughs> Users are like, uh, <laughs> and they touch all of them. Um, that's our failure, right? Stupid users aren't the problem like stupid security people are. Um, and I feel very, uh, very passionate about that. I know I've been part of the problem. I haven't done everything that I should have done over the years to make, make the world better. Uh, when I talk about responsibility, I don't mean it as a pejorative uh, in the term that like responsible disclosure in my mind is a pejorative because it uh, um, has the implication like there's irresponsible disclosure. No, fuck you, there's not, okay? Um, I believe that quite firmly the responsible disclosure uh, is this concept that's been turned into the thing that's right for the vendor and that's not okay, right? The vendor's part of it, but the person that found it's part of it, the public's part of it, we all have different reasons for we disclose in different ways and when I see people say, why didn't you disclose this responsibly? I'm like, they disclosed it. It was responsible therefore, right? <laughs> it's not popular. Like, O'Day is okay. Ooh, that's my tramp stamp. Um, <laughs> God, I hope that ends up on Twitter. <laughs> or as a meme. Um, I, and I, I, I mean, I honestly believe that, right? It's okay to disclose um, in the manner in which you see fit. Uh, you found the vulnerability. Now, there's certainly uh, nuances to that, and there's things that we can argue about the morals and ethics around uh, associated with that, but again, 
you didn't build a secure system. Why would you expect the person who found the defect to then engage you in some coherent, rational way, right? Now, if you're part of a bug bounty program and you're bound contractually, that's a whole different thing. Um, but I'm not actually here to talk about responsible disclosure because that's a, a little bit of inside baseball, right? That's things that we care about with the public at large. Just kind of like I don't really care how Spectre and Meltdown were disclosed. I just care like my computer is now 30% slower. That seems counterproductive. Thanks, Intel. Um, so geolocation is an interesting example of a technology that um, has a lot of uses. And in our industry, this is a common trope, right? Like someone turns on geolocation when they're not supposed to. And like, oops, you know, we're in Ukraine. <laughs> Psych. We said we weren't, but we are. Just kidding. Um, you know, this was actually a big deal for Russia when a bunch of their um, uh, soldiers got out in, in Ukraine. Uh, this has affected ISIS. There have been uh, people, uh, ISIS members in the field have been killed because they left frickin' geolocation turned on. There have been, like, say, federal workers and contractors who have been tweeting out from, like, classified facilities. Like, you know, there's some place that's undercover, and they're like, I'm just getting to work. Click. Oh, right. <laughs> that looks like a house, but it's not. Um, Things like that. It's bad, and we, we will all point and laugh and ha, 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 ha. Well, there's other situations in which geolocation, even in the face of the user not saying, at large, I don't want geolocation, is a good thing, right? Take, for example, floods in Houston, right? Hurricane comes rolling in, um, and, and uh, um, you know, someone calls for help. And this person has to take the time to type in their address and hope they didn't fat finger something and they go to the wrong frickin' zip code or some shit like that, um, and they find them. And it would be great if in situations like this, when someone posts this to Twitter or Facebook, there, there was a recognition, like, this is an emergency situation. We need to be able to relay to people this person's coordinates. Because conversely, there's situations like this, where a person says, I'm in trouble, I need help. Or... I'm, I don't know, a Call of Duty player, and I'm pissed off at someone, and I'm going to swat them, and I'm going to call in and say, hey, I've got my family hostage. Or during the Las Vegas shootings, there were assholes who were actually like, can you help find this person? I was with him, and now I can't find him. And they were posting this shit from, like, Bulgaria and Illinois. They weren't in Las Vegas, right? And the authorities have to stumble around and figure out fact from fiction. So in a universe in which we poo-poo things like geolocation, from an OPSEC perspective, there are times in which it can save lives. Um, and I don't just mean save this person's life, but I can mean if someone from Buffalo is tweeting that they're drowning and they're not, it distracts first responders from actually going to people that need help, which also kills people, right? Like that secondary effect is someone else died because we couldn't find the first person who was lying. Um, there's also things like attacks against our democracy, which I'm pretty passionate about. Um, I'm a big fan of the press. I'm a big fan of people's uh, right to say what they want, to write what they want. Um, the Tennessee GOP account was, uh, I don't know how many followers they had, 100,000, something like that, well-known in the right-wing circle. Turns out they were run uh, by uh, the IRA, the uh, Russian folks, that uh, it was all run out of Russia. It was totally not. The Tennessee GOP, <laughs> it was totally guys in Russia fucking around with a bunch of people in the U.S., trying to get them to think the way they wanted them to think. Wouldn't have been cool if Twitter, who knew where they were logging in from, had said, note, this appears to be a political tweet, and it came from a foreign country. You might want to be aware, right? Think about how people's opinions of all these tweets and all these bots would change if instantly Twitter would turn on the, did you know, question mark, this tweet came from Belarus. You'd be like, wow, it sure wasn't from Illinois. <laughs> Fuck that guy. Because now... What's happened is people have formed an opinion, right? And once they form the opinion, they don't want to change it, regardless if they're presented with the fact that the knowledge that they used to form that opinion was wrong. Once you believe something, it's hard to get you to unbelieve it. So Twitter and the like are complicit in the way that we think today because they allowed all this stuff to happen, right? That's a higher level security concern. It's not like there was a buffer overflow. There wasn't a race condition that led to this. But these are conversations that businesses have because right now what we're seeing is a transformation in industry where businesses think about security in more and more abstract ways, right? They think about risk in bigger and bigger ways than they used to. And they're able to have these conversations, right? We're not just talking about how we patched all our shit. We're able to talk about how does our service affect society? And that's important. And that's conversations that we all need to be um, uh, involved in. And so that cuts to some interesting concepts. Um, one of them is the idea 
of redefining critical infrastructure. Um, so this was um, a concept. So a couple years ago, I was the tech advisor of the Presidential Commission on Cybersecurity, and this was a topic that came up at the time, and I thought it was a fascinating idea. It didn't, it didn't end up in the, in the report, but I, I do feel it's worth mentioning to, to you all. So what if we, you know, you're familiar with critical infrastructure, right? Uh, bulk electric, uh, nuclear, transportation, all these industries that have been defined by executive orders being critical infrastructure. And there's big machinery around what that means and how they have to share information and be open to the government and all this kind of shit. So what if we were re rethink critical infrastructure? What's critical? Is Twitter critical infrastructure? So, as an example, I talked to, no, I talked to a bunch of Coast Guard guys uh, that were down in Puerto Rico uh, helping people, uh, uh, rescuing and helping Puerto Rico recover. And what they said was very, very simple. Twitter was 100 times more useful for them to find people, to save them, and to help Puerto Rico than the telephone network. Right? The telephone network is circuit switch still. There's all kinds of problems, and the whole thing has to be up end to end. Packet networks can come online, they're pretty organic. And further, they can just like go to Twitter and search, like find all the people that need help in Puerto Rico. Click, there's a list. If I have to call in and be like, I need help, okay, what's your number, what's your address, all that, they get all that information, click, pick up the next one, pick up the next one. They're gonna take phone calls, and you can only make so many phone calls at a time, right? Instead, a couple of Coast Guard guys could sit in their data center, or their knock, and just be like, here's 400 people, go find them. Cool, and then the boats go and try to find them. I think that's pretty important. Post Las Vegas shooting, where were we? We were on social media, people trying to find each other on Twitter as it was happening. Is Facebook, is Twitter, is Instagram, who Instagrams? I don't know, somebody. Um, I think Instagram is just for influencers because that's actually a thing on there. You can, be, you can strive to be an influencer on Instagram, which I think is one of the most foul pieces of humanity ever. Um, <laughs> sorry, any influencers in the room. You can sponsor me later when I go for my second career as an influencer. Um, <laughs> honestly, I don't know how, I can't reconcile in my, in my head how Twitter and Facebook aren't CI, right? They are so important to our day-to-day -day activities. Our president is off doing things on Twitter all the time. And when that dude like deleted his account, that was like ha ha funny. That dude could have also said effectively, I'm sick of North Korea, I'm authorizing a strike against North Korea, I would advise everyone, including Hawaii, to go seek shelter, because I'm about to bomb the shit out of some places. You know, President of the United States tweets that on Twitter, what happens? All hell breaks loose, right? There are fucking riots, there's people busting into stores, stealing shit, there are people hiding underground, people finally carrying out that, I think I'm gonna kill that guy, like, you know, whatever. <laughs> All that shit goes down because somebody hacked his Twitter account, right? These are all serious problems, and they're all real, and they affect society in ways that, that affect us the same way that transportation and agriculture do. What about code as critical infrastructure? Open SSL. Who runs it? Uh, everyone, right? Maybe a few less after Heartbleed, but still, it's everywhere, right? It's on every little IoT thing. It's all run all over the goddamn place. What do we do? Well, we, we audit it. And we look to see if there's defects. Do we help the developers? Do we assist them? Do we provide them training? Do we, do we, the things that run the core of the internet, have we put a stake in the ground and said, we need to invest in these things? Not punitively, but assistively, right? To go out and help people that are writing open source code that we all rely upon. Python, I don't know, is Python a critical infrastructure? Sure does run an awful lot of the federal government. Sure does run an awful lot of the private sector. Should we do something about it? Mm, probably. Python 3, that's what we should do about it. Um, <laughs> but the challenge with that is don't punish for failure, right? We have to find ways to reward success. We are very good at victim blaming. We're very good at telling people, just do your job, right? Like, Inspector and, and Meltdown came out, and there was so much like, just patch your shit. I'm like, have you ever worked in a real company in your fucking life? Do you know how hard it is to just patch your shit? And I can appreciate I should have my company in a position where the phrase, just pa patch your shit, results in me going, hitting the big fucking button, and it'll, yes, my shit is now patched. But the reality is, for large organizations, that's a long battle, right? Because they only realized they needed that capability about three years ago, and they've existed for 150 years, because they used to make tractors in the Midwest, and now it's General Electric, and they're in fucking everything, right? If you tell GE, just patch your shit, it's just a table, it's not a button, it doesn't do anything, right? 
So I get really annoyed at that trope uh, of, of things like just patch your shit because it trivializes the problems that we face and it's an indictment of everything we've done wrong from the beginning. So it's up to us to find ways, like we clearly, like CISOs get fired all the goddamn time when things go sideways. There's some punishment, right? What else happens? I don't know, people just buy more product when things go wrong. Sweet. Does any of that really fix anything? We have to find a way to reward the success. Things like, um, I don't know, software liability, I think are an area where, where we can really have some novel approaches in that space, right? There's a concern of like, you can write shitty software, what's the ramification? Nothing. Like, well, maybe I'll lose some customers, but really, do you? No, not really, you don't, right? Did Target, did people stop shopping at Target when Target got owned? No, a few, a couple people who are enlightened. But you know what, the next time you need a toilet paper and you drove past Target, you're like, yeah, I'll, okay, I'll go to Target, right? Like, <laughs> you, you were indignant for like a week, right? And then you paid with cash for a week, and they're like, here's my fucking visa that they just sent me. Take it, I know I'll get it back again later. Like, it just, it'll happen again, and it'll be like Walmart or something, it'll be fine, it'll be fine. Um, you know, and they got, they got punished for that. But the question is, it, there's innovation, right? Like, everyone, you all got projects and ideas and things that you're writing. Like, what if the government came and said, you have to write better code before you can post that thing on the internet? And there's real, real damage associated with that. Like, you will go to jail. Like, it is now a felony to write bad code. You know what I will never do again in my entire life? Even install an operating system that has a compiler, right? Like, it'd be like, nope, here's OS X minus GCC. Like, just throw it away, no Python, no Perl, no, I don't even want Bash, because I will own this box through Bash inadvertently, and I'll go to jail, right? <laughs> Instead, incentivize people to buy software that's better. Hey, company, you get a tax break if you've bought software that's been written to this spec or has been audited in this way or has these capabilities. Like. Cool, that's way better than getting put in jail and incentivizes me to do good things and incentivizes my supply chain to do good things. I don't have to put in a contract, thou shalt write good code. I'll say, if you do these things, I'll buy your code, you get the, the sale and I get to save money on my taxes. Yay, that's great. Everyone wants to save money on the taxes, at least in this town. So um, I, there's gotta be ways in which to foster innovation, in which to be more transparent, in which to have more secure systems that aren't punitive in nature and don't rely on the victim blaming nonsense that we see today. So it starts at places like this, right? Like at universities, at places like West Point and USNA. So one thing we didn't talk about, that's what I meant to say, um, we have uh, for years, uh, uh, West Point, uh, USMA has brought a busload of cadets down and we've been able to get cadets kind of on board our way of thinking, uh, you know, from, from very early on. So um, a busload of cadets. And then after, after like 10 or 11 years, USNA, the Naval Academy is like, can, can we come too? And um, they, I saw USNA people, they're here. West Point may not be here yet, but the, the midshipmen are here. So yeah, yeah, one, one Navy guy in the room. He's like, yep, yep, go, go, go Navy. Anyone, question mark, okay. I'll be over here. Nope. Um, is, are the USNA people in the room? Good OPSEC. Good OPSEC. There's one. The guy's like, yeah, I'll out myself. Everyone's like, shut up. We weren't supposed to say anything. We're here undercover. Your jerseys say USNA. Shit. They're wearing jackets. Yeah, they stand out. They stand out. All For the foreign intel people in the room, they're back there. They're all wearing USNA jackets. <laughs> you laugh, but it's true. Like... That geolocation thing is real. Um, so it starts at the university level. Um, you know, it starts in places where we're learning to think critically about these problems. Uh, my son goes to a liberal arts school uh, in Southern Maryland, and I think all they do is think down there. Um, I, I mean that in the nicest possible way. Um, <laughs> what? Oh, we went to the computer lab. So uh, I'll just out it. He goes to St. Mary's College in Southern Maryland. And, and uh, uh, he went, we went in and we're going like through the tour and we get to the computer lab and we sit in the computer lab and there's like a, a, a 640 by 480 like CRT on a table. I'm like, I, I, I haven't seen one of these that not at the dump in a long time. Like, <laughs> wow, I'm like petting it. I'm like, are you okay? Like, why are you here? Very confused. And, and, and Terrence like, 
we have more gear for ShmooCon than this whole university does. I'm like, yeah, pretty much. And some student like raises their hand and is asking a question about like high performance computing and visualization. Like, is this a good school to go to? And the professor like, yeah, it's a pretty good school for that. I'm like, no, like, no, it's not. They do Bitcoin mining on this monitor. Like, it's terrible. Um, thank you. <laughs> so all these universities are forming their curriculum like now still, right? If you go to Penn State and you go to RIT, I pick on them a lot because I <laughs> play into the home field. Um, I'm familiar with their programs and they couldn't be any more different, right? Like I've probably hired, I don't know, a dozen, 15 kids from both organizations over the last 10 years. And RIT is like super applied, like they can configure firewalls and freaking Tanium and all this shit. And then you go down to Penn State and it's like their policy and they're big thinkers and they know all these frameworks and everything. But if you hand them an actual computer and be like, can you open this up and fix it? They'll be like, I, what is, is that a car? Like they don't know what it is. <laughs> um, <laughs> So, uh, hi Penn State, hi, yeah, we are, I get it, <laughs> sometimes competent. Um, <laughs> woo, <laughs> I'm picking a fight in Hack Fortress later, like, there you go, I, I love you guys, I'm just, I'm just yanking your chain. Um, so when you see that diversity at the collegiate level, you think, well, how are we going to have common ground when it comes to things like responsibility, right? Well, we don't. Right? The professors and the students are still figuring this out. The one heartening thing is a lot of student organizations are doing things on their own, trying to explore this space, trying to figure out, quote, what's right. And it's up to us to help model good behavior, to help think through these problems. And we haven't been very good role models in that regard. There's other organizations such as uh, Year Up. Uh, year Up is a, a fantastic program. If you live in a community where there is a Year Up, I would encourage you to try to engage with them. Year Up, what they do is um, uh, they... Hmm? Okay, um, they uh, are an organization designed for individuals between like 18 and 25 who have the um, kind of uh, academic ability for uh, secondary education, but not the economic ability, if you will. Um, and a lot of them are employed. They might be supporting their families. You know, they've got a job where they have to work because they have to help support their mom or their siblings or whatever it is. And, and they can't stop work in order to go uh, get an education and they can't even take some of the money that they have to pay to go get an education. So what Year Up does is there's, there's, um, they have cohorts that start every six months. The first six months are intensive education around everything from um, you know, business meetings and how to engage your coworkers to having a specialty in business management in IT or cybersecurity. Um, and this is like intensive, like they show up five days a week, eight hours a day in business attire, like a suit, okay? Like actual business attire. And, oh yeah, they have like a whole, I mean, they help provide them the suit. It's not like you have to go buy it. I mean, they'll provide them everything they need. They'll even help them work transportation. They'll help with family care if they need to. Um, and then the second six months is like an intern program. So what happens is uh, private industry will pay, it's about $25,000 to have someone from Europe come and work there for six months. At the end of that six months, the companies have no obligation. You can just walk away and be like, hey, cool, thanks. Um, or you can obviously hire the person that, that kind of interned there. Um, their placement rate um, within six months of graduation is something ridiculous, like 96% of the people um, have jobs. Uh, the median income for those jobs is like in the order of like thirty-five dollars or $40,000, which is way more than they were making prior in there and, uh, to, to coming in. So it's, it's really life-changing for young adults who go through uh, the Year Up program. Um, I, there are other organizations like that around the country. I'm picking up Year Up just because it's the one that I'm most familiar with and I've worked with in the past. Um, but there are non kind of conventional secondary education organizations that can help provide that kind of responsible base where we're teaching people young, here's what it means to build secure systems, to operate secure systems, to help your company think responsibly about being uh, good citizens on the internet. Um, and then finally, it falls to people like us, right? Running conferences, running events, because you all know this industry changes every day. It changes all the time. That's why you're here giving up a weekend, um, you know, to, to come meet, join other people, uh, network, try to learn, because if you're not learning in this space, you're getting stale, everything's changing around you, and you can't keep pace, and it's just a function of the job. It's tough, because it burns you out, right? Like, it torches you. Like, this industry can eat you alive because of the pace of change. So um, when we have to be, we, organizers of, of events, have to be cognizant that when you come here, we have to be responsible for what we present you, right? 
We have to be responsible with presenting you with information uh, that we think pushes the ball forward materially in the spaces that we care about. That's one of the reasons we don't have a break it track anymore. Right? We don't think that there needs to be as much emphasis on breaking systems as there is today in most security conferences. When you go to the security conferences, an awful lot of like red teaming, breaking, hacking, whatever stuff, there's not a lot of how to stop it or how to think more strategically about those problems and things of that nature. So that's what we've tried to focus on. There are, there are and there are conferences now that are like heavily defensive, right? And that's great. I love seeing that. But um, I, I think, um, I mean, obviously, every event organizer can do whatever they want. And I'm not here to be pejorative toward them. But what I, I, I do want to put forward is even when you are attack focused, it has to be for a reason, for a purpose, right? Um, I want to see us get better every single year. I don't know if we're getting closer to solving the problem. I just don't want to see us stagnate. And I certainly don't want to see us be our own naval contemplation, echo chamber, talking about the same shit year after year. Um, I'm, I'm pretty, uh, uh, this is what I do, right? I'm getting to be an old man. I'm not going to change my, my, my spots anytime soon. I'm going to do cybersecurity until I die. Um, and I'd like to see, it, she'd like me to retire before that. Okay, that's, that's a valid point, yeah. <laughs> Check, got it. Um, I'd like you all to leave here after the weekend thinking, I know what I need to do personally to make the internet a better place. Um, in a more secure place and more responsible to the society, more responsible to uh, those around you. Because that's just as important, if not more important, than the technological advances that we're going to make. So anyway, that's my rant this year. Um, uh, oh, you have something? Well, I was just going to say I was super proud of you. My count was five fucks, but three pejoratives. Wow. <laughs> Big words. I think I know what it means, too. Uh, <laughs> I just got it out of context earlier today, so we'll see if it worked out for me. Anyway, uh, T-shirt sales started five minutes ago. For those that are leaving, they're at the front of the line. So I was just here to stem the tide. So see you at 3.30 for the start of the talks. Woo!